hello there, and thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, we're looking at two different angles in terms of the wave of respiratory viruses and the presence of COVID-19 in our province and in our community. You're going to hear in a few minutes' time from Paul Landry, the director of the Strait Regional Centre for Education. And we're going to talk about how respiratory viruses and COVID-19 continue to impact the day-to-day -day delivery of school services and absentee levels here in the Strait Region. But we begin our show this week with a return visit from Dr. Robert Martell. Some of you may recall that he came out of retirement three years ago to assist with the delivery of services connected to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we're going to get an update from Dr. Martell on just how that journey of his has gone, and also his thoughts about COVID-19 and its continued presence here in Nova Scotia, new variants that are making their way into the province, and how this all ties together with the treatment of respiratory viruses that have also reared their ugly head in just the last couple of months. Here's my conversation with Dr. Robert Martell here at the Talil Community Television Studios in Arishat. Dr. Martell, thank you for joining me on Tell Ill 24-7 today. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back. And one of the big reasons that I wanted to have you back is personal, because we recall that three years ago, you were a retired physician. You came out of retirement to make yourself available in case you were needed for any stage of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was very new. We were all trying to make our way through it and all trying to do the right thing. Can you update us on where your status is now with that and what the last three years have been like for you in this regard? So we're three years into this pandemic. Where are you personally with it? And what are your observations about the last three years? Okay. It's a lot to uh, unpack there, but mm -hmm. we'll have a go. Uh, yes, I returned to active practice in, in uh, 2020. Uh, when the news uh, was generally known that uh, we were going to have a, a pandemic and that uh, Canadians, especially the elderly population, would be affected dramatically. First, though, I want to lead by saying that uh, whatever I say here today is a personal opinion. Of course. And I don't speak as an epidemiologist. I speak as somebody who uh, looks at the literature and, and uh, follows uh, the information as it applies to me and my profession. Yes. Um, having said that, uh, my, my interest uh, to return to active care medicine in 2020 was because the data was showing uh, that the elderly population would be disproportionately affected, mm -hmm. especially those in, in long-term care. And evidence would show that that's exactly what happened. And uh, I had retrained as a palliative care physician, and I really believe that there would be a need to uh, help with uh, that aspect of the care paradigm for um, the pandemic. Uh, but as that turned out, um, the Nova Scotia Health Authority at the time had other ideas, uh, and so what I wanted to do did not happen and uh, f they felt that uh, my services were not required. So basically what I did do is uh, offer help to um, the companies that were providing a lot of on-site testing. So I did a lot of testing uh, of individuals who were presenting w uh, without symptoms or with symptoms and traveled uh, around the province doing that uh, for a while. And uh, then when vaccination clinics became uh, needed um, and that whole rollout uh, was rather difficult, I offered my services then. It was rather difficult to get them to understand that uh, I would be willing to help with that. Uh, it uh, took a lot of convincing, which was a big surprise. And uh, eventually we did do, I did do some clinics in Antigonish in Sydney. Uh, so, that's where it's at from the perspective of uh, uh, the association with the pandemic. Um, and most recently, I have uh, agreed to do um, or be part of the virtual care services that are going to be offered in, in the province. Um, 
and uh, that should ramp up in the next uh, week or two. Can you tell me a little bit about what your job's going to be with virtual care? Okay, so uh, that is in flux. Uh, there currently, there are basically th three or four models of virtual care uh, in, the, in the province. There's the private pay model, which uh, a company called Maple uh, and others are offering, in which you can actually um, have a consultation with a physician on a private pay basis. And then there are other models. Uh, the one that's probably most known is uh, virtual care being offered to individuals who exist on the doctor's waiting list for the province. So those individuals become eligible for a virtual care appointment. And uh, they, there are ways of contacting the uh, individuals who uh, place a wait list for physicians like me and others who do this and you get a, a list uh, that you can go through at, at an appropriate time uh, to see individuals. And this is done through um, uh, broadband uh, connection using home computers and most of the individuals doing virtual care uh, are from home. Uh, uh, retired physicians that have come back under a virtual care uh, umbrella. Uh, some are emergency room physicians, uh, which is what my background, uh, my background is, and others are family physicians. Uh, so it's still uh, a learning curve for a lot of us because it's very new, uh, but has tremendous potential to help. Then there will be the virtual care emerge uh, component of this, uh, which I, many people have heard the Premier and others speak about this over the last few days. Um, this has been operational in other jurisdictions, so we didn't re reinvent the wheel here. Um, so Cumberland, um, uh, sorry, not Cumberland, Truro has been uh, involved in a pilot for about a year, um, which I think will have application in emergency rooms and uh, areas like Strait Richmond and other rural areas that don't have staff uh, available uh, would benefit from having that type. So I'm hoping to get more involved in that uh, than the regular uh, virtual care because I think that speaks more to my, uh, my uh, strengths than the other. We've heard quite a bit about virtual care options being rolled out just over the last couple of weeks as you've mentioned so yep. uh, we're glad to hear that we have a, a local physician that's being involved in those efforts as well too that's yes. great wow. so I want to cycle back to COVID-19 we'll mm -hmm. talk about it for just a couple of moments here we remember what it was like three years ago we were just finding out about this uh, you came in to tell ill and you filmed some pieces of advice for people in terms of basic cleanliness in terms of social distancing, social gathering, wearing a mask. How do you feel that we are in terms of the basic public awareness and consciousness today as compared to three years ago? Well, we've learned a lot. Um, COVID-19 uh, was basically, you know, hair on fire approach to this uh, in 19 and 20. Uh, but I think we've learned that uh, this uh, particular virus and the others that the subvariants that have followed are respiratory viruses, which is an important distinction. Uh, as you remember, everybody was uh, gowned and gloved and using uh, disinfectant by the gallon from Javex to Lysol to all sorts of things. And I'm not saying that it's not important to have uh, clean hands, of course it is, and uh, a clean surroundings, all of that is important. However, the bottom line is that this is a respiratory virus, and this is absolutely uh, known to be such, and therefore, how do you spread respiratory viruses? Well, the distance that you and I are to right now is uh, not within the acceptable limit if you believe that respiratory viruses uh, are a problem. So uh, masking obviously is a front line of defense. It was uh, ever thus that uh, if you can prevent uh, particles 
uh, airborne particles to come out of your lungs, uh, through your mouth, and through your respiratory system. They're best kept in you than in others. And uh, so I think that from that point of view, uh, over the last three years, we have learned that that is the first line of defense. Social distancing applies to um, the distance that these particles can move in the air, and there's been a lot of controversy about that as well. I think the generally accepted the distance is six feet, but there are many, many labs that have proved that that is not far enough. But be that as it may, it certainly is a good starting point. And I guess it speaks to uh, if you have a respiratory virus and you congregate in, in groups in which uh, the um, air exchange is not great uh, and people are uh, close to each other that uh, they can actually inhale other people's uh, respiratory particles. Uh, that obviously is not a good idea if you're not masked. So from that point of view, I think that the uh, uh, World Organization uh, most recent recommendations are that uh, masking is still uh, recommended in public places or in areas where you feel that the individual you're speaking with, even on a one-to-one -one basis, if they have conditions like chronic obstructive lung disease, um, you know, they are immune compromised in some way, that they deserve the courtesy of you wearing a mask, even if you're not wearing one. Because it is, in many ways, an act of charity to do that. Well, I want to continue on masking for just a moment. Uh, we have heard n numerous officials, mm -hmm. including Nova Scotia's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Robert Strang, say that masking mandates may be a thing of the past now because, in his words, in a media availability that we participated in, in in Tel Il in November, that there's not mass public buy-in anymore for mask mandates or enforced mask use. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so I think we have to unpack the words. Um, for example, yesterday, uh, Dr. Strang and a number of these officials were presenting at a government health committee on the issue of meningitis and whether uh, university children should be vaccinated, which is off topic. But what was important from a visual was that all of the individuals at Dr. Strang's table were wearing masks. Uh, so I think that speaks to the amount of confusion there is in the communication around public health measures. Uh, and the reason I wanted to unpack the words that is the fact that you use the word mandated, mm -hmm. which implies the law, which implies Big Brother, which uh, raises the hackles on a number of individuals who then tie that to freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think that ha that has caused so much uh, difficulty in trying to get the most basic public health measure across in that if you start to wrap it up in uh, words like mandated, individuals are going to be against it for the wrong reasons. Uh, the reasons people should be wearing masks is not because they are forced to wear a mask, is because it works. That's unequivocal, it works. It works to uh, reduce the amount of viral load that you're going to be taking to somebody else um, and it, it reduces the viral load that you're going to be passing to someone else. So it's just common sense that if you accept that uh, COVID-19 and all its subvariants, especially this last one, um, is so transmissible, why would you not take measures that are, that, that are going to reduce uh, the ability to transmit that particular uh, virus? So. Um, I think Lisa Barrett has been a little bit more uh, clear in her communication uh, than uh, government officials. Um, she's a little closer to the coalface and, and I get, gets it, uh, that uh, it still highly recommends the use of masks, you know, when you're grocery shopping, when you're going to church, when you're going to areas in which there are people that are congregating. You mentioned subvariants just a moment ago, and obviously we are starting to hear now 
about what's been dubbed the Kraken subvariant mm -hmm. of COVID-19. And there have been a few cases, I believe no more than three, identified in Nova Scotia over the past couple of weeks. What are your thoughts on this current variant, which is described as being more easily transmissible, but not having any greater impact on a typical human being than, say, Omicron or, or Delta did. Uh, what are your thoughts on Kraken? Well, I think uh, we're too early in the game uh, to be able to conclude that it's not going to have an impact. I think uh, what is really significant is that uh, this transmissibility is inc it's beyond anything that we've ever experienced. Um, we, when you think of the trajectory of that particular subvariant from when it was first discovered uh, to where we are now, it's now the uh, leading uh, cause of uh, individuals presenting with a coronavirus uh, infection in the U.S. Mm. Uh, it is believed that almost 80% of cases in the U.S. are now of this new subvariant. So, which tells me uh, that um, we will mimic uh, the pattern in the U.S. as we have all along, um, so that in a few months we will have a high degree of transmissibility. And if we are going to be doing uh, testing, we will probably identify that as an issue. So, okay, how is that going to translate into um, the actual impact on health? The the whole premise of vaccination and masking and social distancing and all of the public health measures were very clearly stated at the very beginning of this. And that was, please do this so that you can, we can help uh, manage the resources that we have in treating individuals that are going to end up sick. And of course, at the beginning of this, when no one uh, was vaccinated, and uh, so that the virus had complete control of the playing field, it was, even, it was really important to have those uh, measures in place, and that's why uh, mandates were uh, brought into place, because there was an urgency to get everybody to do the most simple things first. And Nova Scotians stepped up to the plate. You know, we ended up with about an 83% vaccination rate of the first two vaccines, and uh, that impacted our... Uh, numbers very dramatically in 2021. But in 2022, uh, we saw a falling off of uh, vaccinations, especially on, on, in the booster category. And uh, I think uh, the fatigue around social distancing, um, the issues around uh, misinformation and tying masking to freedom, etc., lowered the, the number of individuals who were actually practicing good public health measures. And as a result, we ended up with uh, a pool of unvaccinated individuals providing a Petri dish for the virus to mutate. Uh, and that has happened all over the world. The virus can only mutate if it has a host to do that. And uh, so we ended up with uh, mu and um, you know omicron and all the subvariants uh, which in nova scotia impacted us to the point that of the 700 deaths plus that we have had most of them have occurred in one year yes and the that impact that we talked about that we wanted to prevent at the beginning of all this of you know uh, packed waiting rooms and and plug beds, et cetera, you know, manifested itself uh, with, um, you know, our ICUs on the near, near capacity or if not at capacity. And today, I mean, we have, um, you know, 218 people in the hospital and 19 people in, in ICU. So it isn't gone. And furthermore, uh, the new... Uh, transmissible subvariant has not really taken hold here. And uh, add to that that the evidence uh, is quite clear that vaccination, especially with uh, the bivalent uh, uh, booster, uh, will 
diminish the impact of uh, the effect of this new subvariant so that it doesn't mean you're not going to get it. Uh, it means that if you have all five vaccines, uh, that your chance of getting very ill or getting uh, to, or having to go to an emergency room will be less. I think the data is pretty clear on that. Um, so I think that clearly we are at a point now where we have to rethink the complacency that uh, we have fallen into, um, having a desire to go out this summer and enjoy the holidays with friends, etc. We now have to kind of pull back and say, okay, what can we do to help ourselves, help our loved ones? And the first thing you can do is wear a mask uh, where it's appropriate, keep your hands clean, uh, do things that uh, we were told to do with respect to respecting uh, individuals who are immunocompromised or are in compromised situations like the elderly because it is still a major killer of people over 75 years old. And then go out and get vaccinated. Uh, really, those are the tools that we have. Of course, we have things like Paxlovid and the antivirals and all of that. But um, if we rely on those medications, we would never have enough to do what needs to be done. And there's still a lot of question as to how impactful it is uh, on the outcome of individuals who are severely ill. So, uh, yeah, it's time to kind of regroup and uh, protect ourselves and see if we can get through this next wave. Because you have to remember the biology of, of viruses. The more people are vaccinated, uh, the more people who have circulating antibodies from either vaccines or having contacted, I mean, there are some uh, researchers who believe that 70% of the North American population have been exposed to uh, COVID-19 in some form or another. So what does that do? Well, it reduces the amount of uh, a medium for the virus to survive. So what does it do? It evolves so that it can get around all of these vaccinated people and these individuals that have some antibodies and it develops a new coat of armor, a new way to latch on to receptors. And that's why we are now at a stage where uh, all the low level uh, functioning variants are no longer as much of a concern because our, our immune system has evolved over time, either artificially or because of direct contact. And so we are now battling uh, subvariants that are become more and more sophisticated. And eventually the pool, if, if we increase the number of vaccinated people, increase the, the number of people who are going to be in contact with the virus, we could shut down that pool. And that's exactly what happened with the Spanish flu uh, back in the last century. Uh, so, you know, what can we do differently? We can reduce the pool for the virus to uh, mutate. After, you have to remember, though, that sometimes we can do our best, but where we have areas in the world that don't have access to vaccines, uh, where it's impossible to social distance or have proper masks, then there are always going to be a pool where the virus will find a home and change and then present us uh, with the challenges they fly over to be with us. And the pool is still active in Nova Scotia. I mean, Nova Scotia Public Health releasing its December COVID-19 report just this week. Just over 3,100 PCR tests confirming COVID during the month of December, working out to about 310 a day. And there was a time not long ago when even 10% of that was enough to send most people in the province into a panic. But it just seems, as you say, that complacency has set in. Yeah. And this all comes as Dr. Strang, public health and the Department of Health in general are warning people about a wave of respiratory viruses that have settled in, common cold, influenza, RSV, which is separate from those two. So you're talking about filled up emergency rooms. What are your thoughts on this perfect storm, if you will, of respiratory viruses that do go hand in hand with COVID-19 in terms of being a public health issue? 
Okay, so a cu couple of things. You, you're really loaded questions here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let's take uh, the flu, for instance. Um, this particular strain of uh, flu, um, I, I don't know, how you know what you understand about how vaccines are developed, especially for the flu, but they basically, uh, it's uh, a cocktail uh, of various, uh, uh, they look at the prevailing number of cases of flu in the world. Uh, they try to use Australia as uh, kind of the vanguard of uh, what it's going to be in North America because of the seasons are different and therefore flu usually starts there and then uh, we get uh, the second wave of that. And uh, the vaccine that uh, we have been using for flu for many, many years um, has been sometimes very, very effective and other times not so effective. And the reason for that is you have to guess which type of flu bug is going to get us. Uh, and and they, that's usually six months to a year, uh, usually about six months before they can kind of uh, create the recipe for the vaccine. And there are very bright people who uh, kind of figured this out and, and uh, for the most part, they do a very good job. This year, they have done an absolutely bang up job. Uh, the vaccine is more effective than they ever believed it would be. Uh, but the people have to get the vaccine for it to be effective. And I mean, we have a good program in this province where, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, accessing a vaccine is pretty easy uh, through pharmacies and uh, through family doctors um, and through public health. And uh, it's free. Um, and the most vulnerable, of course, are exactly the same people. It's the elderly, the immunocompromised individuals, and children. Uh, so from the point of view of flu, uh, I think that uh, really that was the responsibility of the individual. They should, they, the data was clear. We have something that works. Uh, if you follow normal measures around respiratory illness plus uh, flu vaccine, you're going to do pretty well. With respect to RSV, that's another issue altogether. Um, there, the, there are two target groups there, and that's the children, uh, especially very, very young, and the elderly. And uh, the treatment availability for uh, that particular uh, uh, virus um, is, hasn't really become that sophisticated over the years from when I started in medicine many years ago. It's basically supportive care. And supportive care is uh, when it gets to the point where you have very significant uh, difficulty, especially if your child is under one and the airways are very small, that supportive care can be extremely costly and uh, rare. Uh, basically, you need pediatricians and you need uh, the infrastructure to be able to do that. So um, that infrastructure, uh, it was busy doing other things, caring for other people. Mm -hmm. And especially in the adult group, uh, issues that have happened in primary care for the last 15 years have resulted in huge numbers of people showing up in emergency rooms in this province for primary care and then the fact that you know we have 130,000 people on a waiting list for a family doctor means that those in community are getting sicker and sicker, which means that they're presenting to emerge sicker. They're entering our beds and not leaving those beds. So the infrastructure to deal with the sick elderly with RSV, who might also have a subvariant of COVID, uh, has been extremely challenging. So. Indeed, uh, the, you know, this period of the next three to four months um, is going to tax everyone in the system. Mm -hmm. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I thought we might. We've unpacked a lot, to use your word. Did you want to add anything else about all of this just before we wrap up here? Uh, well, I think that, uh, I mean, it's too broad a topic to uh, really uh, discuss in, in detail and have an informed discussion. But uh, I think we kind of have to step back a little bit uh, and, and try to project 
what the next two or three years are going to be in healthcare in this province. The reality is that, uh, especially areas like ours in Richmond County and part of Inverness County, um, we have major access issues uh, with care. Our emergency rooms are not functioning to the level that they should be. People have to travel uh, to Anaganish in Sydney, uh, often with an ambulance. Sometimes that can be challenging as well. And so we have to reflect on, on how we are going to manage this. Uh, because it's going to directly impact on our ability to live in uh, rural areas like this. And clearly, none of what is happening in emergency rooms today or in our hospital was unpredictable. You know, bottom line is we had an aging demographic. It's uh, skewed to rural Nova Scotia. Uh, and we did not adjust resources accordingly, either at the primary care level or, or at the infrastructure level. And uh, we are now experiencing uh, the result of these extremely bad decisions that have been made. So I hope that um, what out of bad things come good things, and maybe this is going to reset uh, the whole healthcare con uh, paradigm and have individuals who are making decisions a little bit more informed going forward. Mm -hmm. We certainly hope so. As you mentioned off the top, yours is one man's perspective, but we feel it's a necessary perspective and a very thoughtful perspective. And we appreciate you coming in to share your thoughts about not only COVID-19, but the general state of healthcare in Nova Scotia. And we wish you well in terms of your participation in the new virtual care programs that are being rolled out. Dr. Robert Martell, thank you for joining me on Tell Ill 24 seven today. Thank you, Mr. Cook. All right, Dr. Robert Martell is a retired physician from West Air he is joining the complement of physicians and healthcare professionals that will be involved in virtual care for Nova Scotia in the coming weeks and months. Stay tuned for more of Tell Ill 24 7 in just a moment. Still to come on Tell Ill 24 7, we'll head to Port Hawkesbury Town Council for a review of the town's activities from 2022 with Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton. One of the hardest hit sectors during the COVID-19 pandemic has been the public school system here in Nova Scotia and right here in the Strait region. Absentee levels among staff and students plagued several local schools during that time. And while COVID-19 is not the factor that it once was in terms of shutting an entire school down, respiratory viruses are starting to make their presence known as colds, flu, and RSV are making their way through students and staff here in the local area. To get a perspective on what this means for education delivery here in the Strait area, I spoke by Zoom with Paul Landry. He's the director of the Strait Regional Center for Education, and I caught up with him just recently at his office at the Strait Regional Center for Education offices at CEREC in Port Hawkesbury. Here's that conversation right now. And we're pleased to be joined once again on Tell Ill 24-7 by the director of the Strait Regional Centre for Education. He is, of course, Paul Landry. Paul, thank you for joining us from your office at the CEREC site for the SRCE. Thank you for coming back to Tell Ill 24-7. Thank you for having me, Adam. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Well, we have you here because we know and have known for a while that not only is the school system dealing with COVID-19, as it has been for the past few years, but it's also been dealing with a wave of respiratory viruses, cold, flu, RSV. So we basically want to begin by asking you, how has the past few months been for the Strait Regional Center for Education and its schools in terms of these diseases and in terms of absenteeism? How have things been going? Well, uh, we, we've been, as usual, we, we track our absentee rate uh, uh, on on typically a monthly basis, Adam, uh, throughout the school year. So, so as we were monitoring throughout the fall, uh, our September rate was around 10% uh, and our October rate was around 10%, which falls within the normal range for us. And then in uh, November, we started to see uh, later in November, uh, a little more absenteeism rates that they uh, went up a little bit higher. So uh, in November, they averaged out to about 15%. And then uh, as we moved into December, we started to see more activity and it, and it aligned uh, very closely with uh, 
you know, a, a news conference later in, in November uh, with uh, Dr. Andrew Link and, uh, and Dr. Strang, um, where they provided an update to the province uh, on respiratory illnesses uh, across the province. And uh, said that, you know, at, at that news conference, they said that while COVID-19 at, at that time was, was declining, that they were seeing an increase in, in uh, a number of viruses like colds and influenza and RSV uh, circulating within, within the communities. And so, you know, uh, as a result of respiratory illnesses in our communities, we know we knew that we could expect to see some of that, uh, you know, start to come into our schools. So uh, in December, as, as we noticed uh, uh, in November, it started to go up a little bit. And, uh, and then, then in December, we, we uh, went up to 20. Now, as we know, December uh, is not a full month because the holiday uh, the holidays are in there. So it's a little bit of a shortened month, but we did see, um, you know, a higher rate, which, which we know, we can't say for sure that it was all uh, due to uh, those illnesses, but we know that that there was illnesses in our communities, and uh, you know we can attribute, I'm sure, some of those absences uh, to that to the those rates that got a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. So does this compare to what's commonly called the flu season in other school years? I mean, you and your colleagues have been around the education system for quite a while. Can you compare this to a typical school year in terms of absenteeism for students or staff? Uh, I would say we are we are uh, we are close to uh, you know when we when we do get into flu season, um, those are numbers that we would typically see. We might be a little bit on the higher side of that, but uh, but you know it is typical when when it depends on the type of flu season and what sort of is going around and that sort of thing. So we do deal with sort of bumps along the road uh, throughout the school year sometimes if a flu season comes in and uh, and even even with you know the, the this fall here that what we've seen we've seen sometimes in in some school communities you know the, the numbers would go up for uh, you know a, a week or so or a few days and then they would start to start coming back down and and returning to you know, close to a normal range. So, mm -hmm. so it is, it is Adam, uh, I, you know, I would say that we, we run into this, uh, you know, over the years, uh, and we, and we prepare for it. And, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, but I would say that it's probably this year is probably a little more on the higher side to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll, we'll see what the length, uh, of the season is. That's another piece that, that we, you know, uh, are trying to, to manage through or, or typically manage through. And, uh, so, so we'll see how that, all that sort of, or sort of works out. You mentioned just a few moments ago that the schools and the SRCE as a whole prepare for the flu season and prepare for viruses like this to sweep through the student body and to the staff. What kind of preparations are made, Paul, by the schools individually and by the Center for Education itself in a case like this? Well, and as you know, Adam, over the last couple of years, we've, we've been preparing for uh, for COVID. So, mm -hmm. so you know, returning to September of this year, we, we've been following public health guidance, which, uh, you know, and we, so we we're encouraging healthy habits as we have been for the past couple of years. And, and those include getting vaccinated, staying home if, if, uh, if you're feeling unwell, sanitizing hands and high touch surfaces, you know, when we're entering and exiting uh, rooms and sort of crossing thresholds with, within buildings and those sort of thing. And, and as well, creating supportive environments for those who, who choose to wear a mask. So, uh, and we still have lots of those, uh, those pieces available as well with our, with our, uh, uh, support staff, we, we focus on, uh, on, um, you know, frequent cleaning of, uh, of high touch areas and, and those sorts of things. So, so it, it's, it's an ongoing piece that, that we've had for a number of years. And we did that prior to COVID when, when we, when flu season would hit and then, you know, throughout COVID, those things developed a, a little bit more. And, uh, and that's, I guess, you know, what we've been following to, to this point in time. Now, you mentioned providing supportive environments to students or staff that do wear masks. What are you hearing from your principals and just in general in terms of mask usage in schools? Paul, is it still there? Is it 
higher in some spots than others. What are you hearing just in terms of whether people are willing to wear masks? Yeah, I think, uh, Adam, I think in general, you know, our conversations with 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 schools and so on, that that some um, some staff and some students uh, are choosing to wear masks and for for whatever reason uh, that they have. And, and oftentimes there are multiple uh, different reasons, but uh, but that it, it's going uh, uh, quite well from what we're hearing. And, uh, you know, folks uh, certainly are, are supportive around that and understand it. And I think it's part of us moving, um, you know, out of COVID, I, I guess not completely out of COVID, but, but from where we were the last couple of years, um, it's become a little more normalized. So when people do see um, others wearing masks, uh, they understand, they have an understanding of, of that that's their choice and, and uh, they, you know, there's, there's reasons why they choose to do that. So, and I think they're supportive uh, around it in, in general. So we're heading towards the end of year three of this pandemic. As you mentioned, COVID-19 is still there, but we are quite beyond the situation where you would see a school run out of staff and not be able to actually proceed or that you'd see a lot of students out does this provide more stability for the overall public education system that even with the presence of COVID, the presence of respiratory viruses and the necessary precautions school by school, there seems to be a bit more stability and even a sense of relief among staff and students that the school year for all intents and purposes can proceed as usual? Well, I think, like you say, Adam, it, it, uh, I think people are, are generally... Uh, relieved a bit uh, uh, to move out of, uh, you know, where we were with COVID and, and how we had to adjust, you know, throughout school years, throughout the school years often. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the tremendous staff that we had, we were able to pivot quite quickly. And when I say staff, I mean, uh, our teachers and our support staff and, and our administration and our you know, regional uh, support staff as well, just did an absolutely phenomenal job to to make all of that happen. It was a tremendous amount of work that went on behind the scenes and quietly and so on. And, and really everyone uh, pulled together uh, quite quickly and effectively and efficiently to, to turn things around really quick. So I, I think, you know, uh, trying to sort of move away from that and hopefully not returning to that uh, in the next little while, but we will if we have to, um, I think is a bit of a relief that we get into more of a routine. As, as we know, education is very routine uh, oriented. And, and, uh, and uh, so I think that, uh, you know, sort of moving away from that and knowing that we're going to be uh, in school, in person uh, for a period of time, I think just sort of settles the, you know the 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 system down and the region down and and uh, provides a little more comfort I think to to staff and students and families of of how we do things so that we, we're not having to pivot uh, multiple times uh, so you know people were were flexible and and very cooperative and and did a phenomenal job to keep you know the learning going and and school going and those sorts of things so I think there is as you as you suggest you know some relief uh, across the system that we're not having to do that anymore, but there's other, um, you know, things that we need to deal with. As you say, we, we work through flu season and there's other things that come up. We have, we have hurricanes, we have, uh, weather systems that we deal with, uh, uh, snowstorms, all those other kind of things that throw us some curveballs sometimes. So, and, and, uh, and we all sort of work together to, to make that, uh, to keep things going and make sure that everyone's uh, safe and, and doing well. Mm -hmm. And just as we wind things down here, Paul, uh, I'll pick up just on a point you made a moment ago that if we do see things go south with COVID-19, again, there are fears about the new Kraken variant that has been discovered in a few cases in Nova Scotia, that the board and the schools are ready, that the Center for Education and the schools are ready to be able to take precautionary measures if this turns out to be the case over the next couple of months. Yes, absolutely. We, we as, as we know, we, we came through COVID with, uh, you know, with lots of help uh, with our own staff, but we also had great partnerships 
uh, working with that, you know, with the province of Nova Scotia, uh, education and early childhood development, the Department of Health and other government agencies that really all pulled together and helped and supported us uh, th through those times. So we know uh, um, what we've done in the past and, and, uh, and, and we would be able to pull those together uh, quite quickly if, if we needed to. So, so we're, we're, we're quite confident that if we do have to, uh, you know, shift gears a little bit or make some changes that, that we'll be able to do that and, and uh, work through it uh, uh, as best we can. All right, we've covered a lot of ground here, Paul, as I thought we might. Did you have anything else you wanted to add about all this just before we wrap up? No, that's that's great, Adam. Thank you so much uh, for having us, and it's always great to uh, to speak with Tella. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back. So thank you once again, Paul Landry, the director of the Strait Regional Centre for Education, speaking to us from his office at Sarah. Thanks for joining us once again on Tell Hill 24-7. Thank you, Adam. And we'll wrap up Tell Hill 24-7 this week with a review of recent items from the Port Hawkesbury Town Council table. During last week's regular monthly meeting of Port Hawkesbury Town Council at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center's Shannon Studio, Mayor Brenda chisholm Beaton offered a review of the year 2022 for Port Hawkesbury. Tell Hill 24-7 was at the meeting. Here are some of the highlights of Mayor chisholm Beaton's address. Council is well aware of our three uh, key, or sorry, our five key strategies uh, that we have in terms of strategic directions for the town of Port Hawkesbury. So I'm just going to touch on a little bit of what we have in the document. Um, so of course, active transportation and recreation. Um, you know, just kudos to the to the uh, two committees that that do a lot of the heavy lifting with regard to the, to um, this. Uh, priority. We have the Port Hawkesbury Accessibility Advisory Committee and then we have the Parks and Rec Committee. So uh, certainly thank you to both committee and members for all the work that they've done um, all year round. Um, really proud to have uh, a three-year municipal, municipal accessibility document that we can follow along with and also really proud of all of the accessibility work um, that we've been able to achieve in 2022. I think it's significant. Um, so, you know, certainly um, Gordy gives our accessibility committee updates uh, when we're, we have the opportunity to meet and I you just, and it's, it's very visible around town with the installation of AT trails and um, just positive feedback from citizens as well. Uh, in terms of our housing strategy, um, certainly, I know uh, many of us had the opportunity to take part in the community consultation um, with New Dawn uh, Enterprises. Um, the work that we're doing in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, I think, is tremendous. At the end of the day, um, we're going to come out with a really powerful document that will help lead the charge in terms of what the town can do uh, to move the needle on housing and also hopefully looking at um, the establishment of a not-for-profit arm that can also take on some of the meet some of the needs of the gaps that we currently have with regard to housing, particularly affordable and accessible housing. So that's really encouraging. And then over to waterfront development. I could have Mark do this one if you like. <laughs> no. um, waterfront development has been um, certainly exciting, uh, you know, certainly waterfront development in the overall plan is going to take a phased approach, um, but some of the notable things that we've been able to achieve in 2022, um, just that fantastic new accessible uh, boardwalk is just incredible, getting amazing feedback from citizens with regard to how um, easy it is to use that facility that we have down at the, the waterfront. Um, also, you know, as uh, Sunset Park is coming together, you know, that's also very visible changes that we're getting wonderful compliments from citizens and uh, really exciting to see how the waterfront will continue to develop into 2023. And of course, um, you know, many thanks to, to our town staff, um, but also the Port Hawkesbury Waterfront Development Advisory Group as well. They do a lot of work. And then we have uh, our healthcare, professional recruitment and retention. And the bulk of that work is done in collaboration with uh, Richmond County under the Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health uh, group. And lots of wonderful uh, progress being made at that table. And it's really, it's, it's, it really is a wonderful example of regional collaboration. 
Um, and what I have in our review is mainly, um, I guess, the, the readily uh, visible benefits uh, directly to the town of Port Hawkesbury. Um, like, for example, a new physician will be starting at the Port Hawkesbury Collaborative Clinic. Uh, the tentative start date will be April 2023. Um, also on the retention side, having the Community of Care Awards Gala what is just incredible. Um, we're still getting positive comments from our medical health care staff who took part in that, and they, they really, really feel appreciated and that we see all the hard work that they're doing, and I think it's just a wonderful thing. On the economic development side of things, um, as many of you may have noted, uh, we are looking at, um, of course, our Economic Development Advisory Committee. Uh, we are combining that with our Housing Committee so that we can have a hyper-focused um, push towards promoting the town from a housing development perspective. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we see that there's been wonderful momentum uh, with the economic development group um, to really kind of dig into the opportunity around offshore wind and green hydrogen. Um, and really that ball has been bunted over to uh, our new uh, Strait of Cancel Offshore Wind Task Force. So it's all wonderful items that, have, that we've been able to um, bring forward in 2022. Um, other key milestones, of course, it's all about streets. <laughs> it's all about streets and sidewalks. Um, citizens, are, you know, are, are want to see that kind of work done on an annual basis. Um, so you'll see in the annual uh, report um, a list of the roads uh, and roads that have sidewalk infrastructure that have been um, rehabilitated. Some of it has been uh, milled and, and paved and patched. Um, so I think it, has, it was a very ambitious plan, and kudos to Public Works for all the work that they've been able to achieve. Jason, if you could pass that on uh, to the staff. Um, just an incredible amount of work. Again, um, citizens are noticing all of that work, so it's great. I'll tell you how we know it's working. We're not getting very many calls about streetlights anymore. <laughs> so that's how we know it's working. So. Thank you, I appreciate that, Jason. And um, we also know that it's been a very busy front on the Landry Lake side of things as well. Um, you know, certainly just, you know, looking at, and Landry Lake, of course, is a shared water utility uh, between the town of Port Hawkesbury uh, and the county of Richmond. And of course, you know, it's not, it wasn't all good news. We did have the unfortunate uh, fire at our public works building. Um, but I have to say our Public Works crew are, are certainly managing, um, you know, exceedingly well considering the, the duress of no longer, not lo no longer having a, a place to do their work. Um, but certainly in 2023, we're going to be working uh, towards a, a new Public Works uh, facility. And emergency preparedness, well, you know, I think we all, we will remember uh, Fiona for many years to come, but I will say that um, emergency preparedness is something that I definitely wanted to mention. Um, we have an incredible uh, amount of brain trust and capability um, with our Port Hawkesbury Volunteer Fire Department and certainly with our senior staff. Um, and the response uh, during Fiona was incredible, so I definitely wanted to make note of that. Um, and just quickly, regional collaboration is certainly something that council it is really, um, you know, we know that in order for Port Hawkesbury to grow um, and in order for our regional neighbors to grow, we, we need to be working together. So in terms of regional collaboration, we already mentioned the water utility. Um, we share in the governance of the Allen J. McCacken Airport. Um, we also have the Joint Business Park Commission. We have the Cape Breton Regional Enterprise Network. So I guess that is 2022 in, re in review. And I guess just to, to close, um, really proud of how progressive uh, and active our council and our senior staff and all of our staff of the town of Port Hawkesbury has been. Uh, and in my mind, 2022 has been an incredible success. So that, that certainly is um, you know, something to be proud of. So thank you. Thank you to council and thank you to town staff. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Tell Ill 24-7. Thank you for tuning in and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Dr. Robert Martell and Paul Landry. 
And a special thanks to my colleagues at Talil Community Television, Callan Cowan and Nick Budro, for filming and formatting the interview footage with Dr. Robert Martell that you saw earlier in the show. If you have any thoughts or comments about what you've seen over the past hour, or you'd just like to make some suggestions for future editions of Talil 24-7, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863. And you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928. And the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. Don't forget to follow Talil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And our YouTube account features every single edition of Telil 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and segments from our shows, and our sister program here on Telil, Roundtable. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thanks once again for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.